Uh, welcome to the La La Land Records uh, Music of the Orville event. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, La La Land, uh, Fox, uh, Fuzzy Door Productions, producers of the Orville, and of course, Harmony Gold. Uh, uh, my name is Jeff Bond. Um, uh, I wrote the World of the Orville and the liner notes for this album. Uh, I've been described as dry but engaging. Uh, and I'm going to hope to live up to that tonight. So uh, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the Orville. Uh, you're all familiar with the show? <laughs> what, what do you call or fans of the Orville? Orvers? Orvies, we we, we got to figure that out. Uh, the Orville is a fantastic show. It's got great stories. It's got incredible visual effects, fantastic characters, uh, powerful stories, and it has probably the best music uh, of any show on television. It, it is. It, it's like having a, a, a fantastic movie score, actually better than a lot of <laughs> movie scores uh, I, I've heard recently. Uh, so we want to talk to uh, the people who made that music uh, tonight, but uh, first uh, let's welcome the creator, star, uh, writer, producer, he basically does everything in the show except write the music, uh, Seth MacFarlane. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the man who wrote the, the fantastic theme music for the Orville uh, is a veteran composer, Bruce Broughton. Uh, another one of the esteemed uh, composers who writes music for the show's episodes, Joel McNeely. Uh, yet another veteran of movies and television scoring, Mr. John Debney. Uh, and a great uh, arranger, uh, composer, uh, Andrew Cotty. Uh, so, uh, Seth, uh, to risk uh, asking you something you probably answered like 500 times in the past year, uh, what inspired you to make this show and why was this the time to make a, a, a new spaceship show? Uh, well, you know, I, I, when I was a kid I was a fan of optimistic, bright, utopian sci-fi and I think that the genre has kind of steered away from that in recent years. I think a lot of what we're seeing is very dark. And, uh, and very grim and doesn't really paint a flattering picture of our immediate future and doesn't really provide much of a blueprint. And I think there was a big um, void left when uh, Hollywood kind of abandoned that sort of storytelling. And I loved it when I was a kid. I missed it and I didn't see anyone doing it. And so I, I decided to do it myself. Uh, yeah, and you really did do it yourself. You're actually the star of the show, uh, which is a pretty ballsy <laughs> thing to do. Not that you're inexperienced. You've st starred in several movies, but uh, you know, to be the captain of a starship uh, is a pretty huge thing to take on in addition to all the other creative aspects of the show. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it was kind of too good to pass up. I mean, I, I, I got that far and I was like, I can't do that and not put on the fucking suit. You know, it's, it's, it's just, I, I just, you know, you got to enjoy life, right? Okay, incredible. You have also, you know, I've been on the, the, the show's sets are like Disneyland. It's like uh, they actually built the first two decks of the ship, so it's all self-contained. You just walk around, you go on the bridge, and there's like an 11K view screen that projects the, the stars and planets, so you actually got almost got sick <laughs> standing up there because you feel like you're thousands of miles up of, you know, above a, a, a planet, uh, and you have the greatest bedroom of, uh, of uh, like, <laughs> way better than any other starship <laughs> captain's bed. It's, it's incredible. Jesus Christ, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Only took, what, five These minutes? God I damn noticed. it. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, uh, you, you, you okay, are... Well, as long as it's out, we might as well have a ball. 
It's it's a it's a it's a dream come true. I think for for that, that's one of the things that like. Uh, that's it, just for watch, time. I know this is crazy, but uh, it, it just like it, to project your, yourself in that into that environment as like a fan of these kinds of shows. It's like everything you would w want to have, and 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 you kind of get to play in this very real world. Uh, but but you're also uh, you know you're a musician. You are a performer. And I know that you're an aficionado of movie and television music, and that you have a keen interest in this. Uh, so when you, uh, I don't know what order of, of, because since you had to create so much for this show, I don't know, and, and music is typically the last thing that's done on a show, the last thing that's thought about. But sort of how soon were you thinking about what kind of music you wanted the, on this show? What, what kind of models and inspirations were you looking at for that? I mean, I'm 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 an insatiable collector of film scores, uh, both past and present, and so that I mean that that was, I mean, as early as shooting, I in my mind have some idea of how the music is going to fit in. I mean, I I know with with, you know, a lot of shows it tends to be wallpaper. I, I think. Um, Spielberg showed us better than anybody how music can be a character in a show if you really embrace it and let it shine and let it be present. Um, I think a lot of directors tend to be scared of the score nowadays, either either ignorant or scared. And as a result, you see a lot of, I think, really boring music on television and in, and in film. And, and I think when it's done, when, when it's really built from the ground up, and you, and you even in the in the script phase, when I'm writing something, it tends to be with an eye towards, yeah, the music is going to take, take the forefront here. You know, this is, this is, you know, here the actors are going to do their thing, and, but here it's going to be all about images and, and music. And, and so I, I think, um, I mean, as early as possible, as you can, uh, you know, leave room for it, um, I think, you know, there's that classic scene in Star Wars where Luke is looking out at the two sons. And it takes its time, and it's a really gorgeous piece of orchestral music. And I think that's something that is, it, I always look to that scene as something that is woefully lacking in mm. what directors are doing in the genre now. They just don't know to leave that space um, and to, to have, have confidence in the fact that once the music is in there, you're going to be fine. You know, you don't have to go at this kinetic pace, just, just, just take a breath and let the composer do their thing. And so that, that's, I, I tend to, to look at a story f with that in mind from, from the second I put pen to paper. Yeah, this is one of the few shows that has a, a lengthy title sequence uh, with a, a memorable piece of theme music you can actually hum. Uh, and and uh, the, even uh, the sort of the transitions, the the space sequences, you seem to t those take longer, and get the, you give the music a lot of room to breathe and make statements within those sequences. Yeah, and you know, I, in season two, one of the biggest things that that um, it was, it was a very welcome change for the show was that we actually had another, I think, like six to eight minutes of. Um, of, of program time, they structured the commercials differently, and so we were suddenly we suddenly had all this extra time to play with, and all of that went into I mean you know it's a savvy Hollywood crowd, but if you don't know, it's what's called shoe leather, where it's 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 not dialogue, it's not um, story, it's it's imagery that lets you take a breath and take in the um, the set or the visual effects work and the music, and that's where all of that went, and and um, and and I th I think it was. You know, hugely transformative for the show, and and um, it's 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 become kind of a kind of a staple. And you have uh, you know composers that you've worked with. Some of them you worked with on uh, record albums. You have uh, your other shows that you worked with composers on. So who did you uh, think about initially? Uh, obviously, you picked Bruce Broughton uh, to do the the theme music to this show, and and Bruce has done uh, two of the greatest western scores ever written: Tombstone and Silverado. Uh, uh, he's done Young Sherlock Holmes, one of the greatest fantasy scores uh, probably ever written. I did, I did a great space score, uh, Lost in Space, uh, uh, in '97, I think. Uh, so, so uh, 
uh, he had pretty good tr credentials for this. Was, was he one of the first guys you thought of in terms of a theme? Yeah, for I this? mean, with, with the exception of Andrew, who I, who I, because we're close to the, you know, we're close to the same age. It's like I, th th these are all composers who I, I mean, when I was in college, I was buying their stuff. I was, I was buying. I, I knew the work of every person on this stage, um, and I was a fan. And so I went into it. Um, you know, I had tracked the course of film music, and I had. You know, I wasn't really seeing, with the exception of, of John Williams, you know, the, you, you weren't really seeing films still produced that had this kind of expressive orchestral music that, that really kind of had something to contribute. And, um, and you know, I, I didn't really have to think hard to, to um, you know, come up with some names because they were, they were out there, they were working, and, and, um, and, and they were... Shockingly uh, ready to do a show with me. <laughs> uh, well, let's, uh, Bruce, uh, I want to ask you about uh, the theme to this show. This is a show where I watch the theme, <laughs> the, the, the main titles every week. And uh, for one thing, very few shows have main titles that last more than three seconds now. Uh, so it's actually asking a lot. Uh, to get the audience to watch a lengthy main title sequence now. Uh, you have like some of the most beautiful special effects uh, I've ever seen. You have this gorgeous space sequence that's certainly going to hold audiences' interest, but you uh, had to create a theme for this show. And this was done, uh, at least for you, for, like fairly early. This was done before you wrote the entire pilot score. So what, uh, what kind of... Uh, things did you guys discuss about what you wanted from this theme and how did you go about executing executing it Bruce first of all it's interesting to find out that one of the reasons I got hired because I wasn't dead yet <laughs> <laughs> um, actually all the stuff all the stuff that Seth was just talking about how he feels about music I would second as someone um, who was around him and working, you know, working on this new project. Um, he, he talked a lot about the show that he was developing. Uh, he said it's a sci-fi show, it's, a, it's sort of a dramedy, but the music does not play the comedy. Uh, the music plays the drama. He said it's not a dystopian show, it's not one of these dark, you know, things like we've been doing. I mean, all the things that he just said. So uh, by the time I got ready to, um, to do the show, I think, I think I had seen the script to the um, to the pilot, but I was getting information visually as to what it looked like. I was getting a lot of information as to what it looked like visually, so I had a pretty good idea of the kind of theme that we were looking at. And also, I knew uh, that um, because of Seth, we were getting a one-minute main title, which, as you say, is unusual because hardly anybody does it anymore. But the titles are one of those ways that you bring people back from the refrigerator. You know, it's like, oh, my show's on. It's also those things that 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 attach themselves to the show and to the characters and to the things that you like about it. I mean, you can go back to a TV show from 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago and play some of those themes and you know exactly what that's representing. So the opportunity to be able to do that again now, as opposed to something which we used to do you know, all, all the time several years ago, was really great. And also to, just to be able to write a melody that, that hopefully would be memorable. So I wrote two of them, one that wasn't memorable and then I wrote this one. Um, <laughs> And, um, and it did happen early. I mean, it happened, I think, um, I think you'd already started shooting when I, when I did the main title, because they, they needed to cut the main title. So, so Seth called for a, um, asked if I would do a, a, a mock-up. Now, here's one of the other selling points about Seth, okay? Um, he, when he called, he said, he wanted to see whether I was interested in doing the show, which of course I, I was. Uh, and he said, one of the things is you don't have to do any mock-ups, just write the music, come in and record it, and then go home, like in the old days. And I thought, man, that's great. That's really great. Um, except that I did have to do a mock-up for the, for the theme, which actually wasn't a bad idea, because I did it as a piano thing. I didn't, uh, I think it initially was a piano thing. Yeah, just a tune. piano track. And that way, if the tune is strong enough, it'll withstand just a bland uh, performance like a piano. And... Um, that turned out to work well, so then I think I did a, an orchestral mock-up, which is what they cut to, and that became basically what the theme was. So it was a, um, yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a great opportunity. I was, I was really happy to work on it. Every time I watch that 
show and you know watch that title sequence i'm always thinking okay i've seen this a bunch of times i could probably fast forward i gotta hear the end uh, the, uh, that ending cadence uh, it's like i can never fast forward through that well i don't know if you're going to explain this but why is that <laughs> so great is it just the orchestration the way the the the, the instruments you're using in that final phrase that there's something about that that's really infectious it's movie magic. Movie, movie magic. <laughs> it, well, it plays with, you know, it, it moves with those sound effects of the ship, you know, firing up and going off perfectly. And that's well, part of it. Well, as I said, I, I wrote the theme first and they cut, the, right. they cut it to him. So I, whatever there is in there, there was planned together. So it, it didn't happen. Nothing happened by accident. Okay, Including, so. I was just thinking as this thing was playing, um, sort of like a, sort of like a, a science fiction show where you have a starship going through the universe going to different places over and over and over and over completely different places this tune goes about as far away as you can from the original key i mean anybody who's a musician in the audience it starts in c and it goes all the way to g flat and finds its way back again it goes to all these different keys and then ends up where it's supposed to be so in a, in a way um it's sort of a fitting way to do a sci-fi theme you know because talking to you about lost in space years ago you said you know you th thought of it like a western uh which you are obviously an expert uh at you know creating this kind of wide open spaces and I, you get kind of the same sense there with that that kind of lavish approach you took to that well th this is the first time that you actually see the orville and um and it's also the pilot so it's a good time to start introducing your material and, and getting it set up. And um, with, with all the banter that the, that the two guys are doing in the scene, what you're really focused on is, what does it look like? What are we doing? Where are we going to go? This is, man, I've got my command. What am I going to be doing? So there's a sense of grandeur that you have that I think basically underlies all of this stuff with that theme. And um, so basically I'm playing not so much open space, but that, oh, here's the Orville, here's the big, beautiful Orville. And, and, and actually, you know, it looks really impressive. So you've got to come up with something that sounds pretty good for it, too. You know? I think that's basically all I was thinking. The great thing about uh, the treatment of the music on the show is just, it's got a great mix. Uh, uh, sound effects have gotten so dense, you know, in the past few decades. They, you can do very complicated music, and it can still really be buried behind sound effects. But uh, you really let the music punch through uh, and kind of hit you in the gut when it needs to on the show. It's not me. That, that's him. That's what I was talking to. Yeah, Tony. that's his job. I meant Seth. <laughs> It's, <laughs> it's always, you know, it's interesting. It's the one kind of, I say the one downfall of being on a broadcast network. It's, there's, there's there a many. couple, but um, <laughs> in, in 2019. Um, yeah, it is, it's, it's, it's interesting when I, when I, there's weird compression that they do when the show airs that always kind of takes away some of what we hear in the mix. And so, you know, if, if when I go home and I watch a thing on Hulu or I run it through like Apple TV and, you know, you hear like the true mix, it really kind of pops through. And, and so that's, you know, it, 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 again, it is, it, we're always trying to find what that, what that balance is in these mixes, like because it sounds one way on air, but it sounds a different way in perpetuity on the, uh, the streaming platform. So you, you have to kind of ride that balance so you're not, you know, invisible on one side or blowing people out of their seats on the other. Uh, Joe McNeely, uh, you have also, uh, you have experience doing at least one Western. You scored Seth's uh, A Million Ways to Die in the West. Uh, and you're also, uh, the, I believe, the first person besides John Williams to write Star Wars music uh, uh, for uh, this thing called Shadows of the Empire, uh, which is fantastic. There's, it has fans. Um, You've gotten to do some of the coolest scores uh, for this show, and uh, I, I want to show a clip um, that, that shows, you know, we've got to do action and, and drama on this show, but the, the show also has great science fiction plots, and so uh, what all you guys get to do is kind of score uh, real ideas uh, and w along with these uh, fantastic special effects. So uh, it's, it's, that's an incredible scene. Uh, to talk about like how you handle something like that. Is, are, there, are you seeing finished effects when you're working on something like that? And you also get to adapt Bruce's themes too. So uh, if you can talk about how, what it's like to work with, with that melody. Mm. Um, well, the, 
The answer to the first part about the effects is no, I'm not seeing anything close to finished effects. And I'll go through the whole writing process without ever seeing them. And I said to Seth at the last session, I feel like at, at our recording sessions, it's the first time I get to see you know, pretty close to a completed visual effects. And for me, it's like Christmas, because I've been looking sometimes at just this green screen you know, or something, and then there's just all this rich detail. And it's just so fun to see it all come to life and, and thrilling, actually. Um, and you know, yes, these sequences, it's like, you know, John and I talk to each other sometimes when we say we're, we're like pinching ourselves because these great sequences are teed up for us that you just, yes, you maybe get once in a movie every five years or something. And there's almost one every show. There's one that's coming in the season finale that's one of the most fun things I've ever done. And without giving anything away, it's about three and a half minutes of pretty much just music driven, you know, excitement. And, you know, so it's, it's just a joy just to work on these. And then finally, Bruce's theme is is just so re redolent of the show itself. It, it feels like a part of the fabric of the show to me already. And and my takeaway from it is, is it expresses great uh, joy and hope. Mm -hmm. do, do you find you, you know, when you see you've finished effects, are you making a lot of changes on the re recording stage? I know that's something all of you guys are capable of doing, which is amazing. Uh, but do you, does that happen a lot? Not, not a lot. It's it's usually like when, um, well, in the last show, uh, w the ship is revealed at a certain point. And in my visual effects, it was revealed at a certain point, And I did a, a, a swell there. In the final visual, it was revealed at a different point, And then I, it turns out I was late. Things, technical things like that. But in terms of the detail, I know what's going to be there. I'm thinking of, of not the green screen, but, you know, about the whatever we're, we're going to be looking at. Uh, you do a, a, like a classic uh, like Jerry Goldsmith thing where I, you double like xylophone and flute, right? Uh, I love that. Uh, no, I invented that. He <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who invented it, but I, I absolutely love that. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Jerry. It's, it's, if it's not obvious to you, um, we're kind of swimming in the pool of Jerry Goldsmith, or at least I am, a, a lot of the time. Um, and I say that with the greatest respect of, in addition to the guy sitting next to me, he's one of my favorite film composers of all time. And he created this kind of tonality and an orchestrational style, um, a style that is in a way kind of minimalist. Um, and it seemed to be the, a, a real usable fabric for the show. So. Um, you know, I, I always thought when I was writing these kind of Jerry-esque cues that I was doing it with the utmost respect, hopefully. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's just uh, it shows how much excitement you can get into that kind of mo uh, movement. Just accompanying the action, you know, with the movement from the orchestra, it's, it's fantastic. And you don't get to see it, hear it a lot anymore. I just love hearing that. Especially again. xylophones. <laughs> exactly, exactly. What, I mean, to me, just getting across that idea, I, I was like, it took me a minute to realize what had just happened. And it's, you know, you've already got a fascinating idea of this planet kind of jumping ahead in time, hundreds of years, uh, you know, every act in this, uh, this episode. But then you have to sort of show, well, wait, this robot spent this entire period and it sort of didn't mean anything <laughs> to him. Uh, how, how do you sort of address that music? Musically. Well, um, it, it kind of fit into place because many of these ideas were in works throughout the show. So the the, the kind of the the rich English kind of string theme you hear there was kind of a like an ecclesiastical theme that I wrote because there was a religious subtext. Um, and you know, by the time you've kind of been through the show, you have a certain amount of material developed, and this was kind of the where it all ties together. This is what happens when you actually do real composing <laughs> on a show. It's, a, it's weird how that works out. Uh, uh, John Debney uh, just uh, had a big hit with The, the Greatest Showman. Uh, you, you, did, I, you did one episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, very good episode. I actually did three. You did three? Oh, what, am I, what am I thinking of? Why, okay. I you did, did two, two but, um, 
but there, it was a different approach, and 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 yeah. Seth kind of referenced this uh, that the, you know a lot of these shows were done with more of a wallpaper approach. It was it was more textural, and this you are really getting to do you know some fantastic uh, orchestral stuff. Yeah, I was getting my feet wet. You know, it, Seth was so kind to invite me to the party, and and you know this incredible table had been set by Bruce and Joel and, and Andrew, I, I hadn't met you yet. Um, but yeah, this is, I, I have a similar background probably to everybody on the, uh, on the stage. I grew up with all these great shows, Star Trek, etc. I got to do a show called Sequest years ago, right. which, oh, thank you. And that kind of enabled me to work out those muscles, you know, that that I've always wanted to work out. And then when Seth called, uh, I kind of have fun with when Seth and I spot, sometimes I'll, he'll throw a reference out and I'll throw a reference out. And he always is, he's better at it than I am. Because he knows exactly, he's got, you've got such a great I, I remember I grasp. bought like the soundtrack to Sequest. I think when I was in college, before I had seen the show, and I was like, this is going to be great. When I see the show, it's going to be just as good as the music. Was it? <laughs> I watch the Not. show and I'm like, this is bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> this is, like, this is, we so, tried. Thank it, you. <laughs> your score promises so much. We, we did try. We did try. <laughs> anyway, doing it, you know, just coming in, uh, up here with these guys and being in the company of these amazing composers it's like joel and i we, we sort of hit each other every every now and then you know like i will have seen his or he might see one of mine and andrew i think i emailed you when i saw a couple of your beautiful shows and this is the best uh gig one can ever imagine as a composer because you know seth is always sort of saying how high can we jump and he says jump higher and that's kind of the the mantra is that we have a lot of fun, and we get to write this incredible music with these visuals and these great storylines. So, so how how do you characterize a d dark matter storm exactly? Um, I I think of it more this way. I the great thing about working with these guys is that we all have our own take on things, and I think I tend to go a little more rhythmic, and that so approaching a cue like that, I always want to, Seth is such a great, you know, captain of the ship, and, uh, you know, a lot of times you, you'll want to keep this motion and propulsion going, and so that was what I needed to do in this cue, was just keep the motor going, keep, you know, we're shifting, but we're building to something, um, and when we cut outside, you know, that's the fun part. Because when we cut outside to space and the ships, you can just sort of go for it. And our trumpets and our horn players and everybody blasting at 11. It's quite exciting. Um, but yeah, that's what that one was about. It was about the, the crew, the peril, what's going on outside, and then just making a big, bold statement that we're going to commercial and you, we want you to come back after the commercial. So, uh, so how did you uh, approach? Was it just the rhythm of seeing her run that kind of inspired that approach? Maybe because I'm a, by trade, I was a guitar player. I was in the rhythm section, and um, and so I'm always looking to kind of amp it up, you know, just muscular. And Seth gives me the opportunity to kind of do it. And this one was one of those again where. A lot's going on. There's a ticking clock, and it just had to kind of get going, but hit all the moments and hit when we get outside. I love doing that kind of stuff, and uh, I don't know why I love doing it, Seth, but I do love doing it. Um, and uh, it, it's it's a challenge, and I love writing melodies, and Joel and Andrew are masters at that, and I love to do that too. But there's something really fun about this on the stage with, again, if we're blessed, which we are with this show, to have 80, music, 90 musicians. There's something just really exciting about it. And so that, that, this one was about, you know, getting her going. This is her mission. Uh, you know, Bad Isaac is going to try to take her out. And it's, 
Mission Impossible, really, for her. And that's the way I sort of looked at it. And then there's a great moment. Seth had a note for me. I thought it was a really great note, which is right when Alara makes the, there's sort of a moment where she changes and she decides she's got this. And then that gets a little more sort of heroic. And it was a great note Seth gave me. And that's why we changed when she's in at the thing and, and she's going to destroy their ship. Uh, she makes that decision. And that, that was great. Yeah, there's a great architecture to that piece. It's you know very self-contained, but it goes on to you know you get to a whole other level when she actually engages uh, Isaac in the fight. The r rhythms become even more exciting, which I thought was a great accomplishment. Thank you. Uh, the only other thing I would mention, like Joel said, is that our friend Jerry, uh, God bless him. Um, did so much with an economy of notes, and sometimes it's just notes playing fourths and fifths. Uh, and so I'm kind of, this is my little homage to Jerry and James Horner, to be honest. Because James was, <laughs> yep, loved him. James gave, sort of gave me my first big break. And so I, there's a little of the, the James homage in there too. And I hope you like it, James. But. <laughs> Uh, Andrew Akati, you got to score uh, one of the one of the craziest episodes uh, of this show, and uh, this is another great example of, of just kind of having to score, but tr you know, truly bizarre ideas and, and visual effects. Uh, so, and I, I believe that was this your first uh, episodic television score? Yes. Yes. So, what? Tell me, kind of, how you got in, involved. I know that you'd worked uh, on a record project or, or two with Seth. That's right. Yeah, I'd, I'd worked with I'd worked with Seth as an arranger um, uh, for his music projects, and actually. Nelson Riddle said this um, that being being an arranger. Um, and using your imagination to score a song and tell a story through your arrangement of an existing song is essentially the same job as having a picture and t telling a musical story to fit around that picture. You're working around the same idea of time constraints, um, having a particular style that you want your music to be in. So it was kind of, it was, it was Seth taking a leap of faith uh, on me um, and it was also me essentially actually doing a job that I was doing already. So it was just kind of adapting what I was already doing to a, to a different medium. How do you get your head around just this concept musically? I love the ornamentation and, and just the, the mood that you create. And I assume, of course, that you weren't looking at final yeah. visual effects when you started working Absolutely. on this. Absolutely. This is, this is the point that Joel made earlier, um, that what, what we see was nothing like that. Um, it, 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 uh, I, this this was something where I had to kind of rely on the script. You know, I had to rely on what they were saying, and also, I mean, the scripts are very. Um, the, the description in the script is very good. Um, so it, it, yeah, I, I I knew that the the temporary visual effects I was getting were were essentially space fillers. So the cuts being made, th that's the timing I'm going to be dealing with. But what we're actually seeing, I had to uh, rely on what was in the script. I had to ask Seth in the spotting session, you know, what are we going to be looking at? And the answer was we don't know. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we didn't really know at that stage. Um, but I, I took I, I took the direction of the of what we were going to see there very literally. So we've essentially got something that's beautiful and no one's ever seen before. So I tried to you know. So there's a kind of there's some lengthy uh, sustained music which I was trying to create the sense of awe. And at the same time, I think it's Alara says, "What are those energy pulses?" And then there are so li little glints of light around everywhere, um, which were actually even in the temporary visuals they were there. Um, so I just took that direction very literally, and I have, you know I've got glockenspiels and flutes, and you know th throughout that entire queue, there's actually this constant ping, 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 ping going on of all the, of, of all the uh, ethereal kind of celestial high instruments. Um, so it was really like a kind of primary school music lesson of you know now we're going to make a music about a rainstorm or something like that. You know it was it was actually taking the uh, visuals very literally and and, and translating them into music and he's you know he's 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 too modest to mention this himself but you know it's one of the 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 uh 
venues that brought me into contact with Andrew was um, there's a, a British-based orchestra called the John Wilson Orchestra that specializes in, uh, buy their albums, they're fantastic, specializes in recording um, classic MGM charts, class, you know, classic arrangements um, from the you know, 40s, 50s, and I guess early 60s. And, um, and a lot of those charts are, are gone. Um, for you know things like the Wizard of Oz and Brigadoon, and Gigi, and you know these these old films that are that you know these these charts are gone, and and so um, Andrew uh, did a lot of reconstruction work on these charts, literally just using his own ear. And these are you know this is some of the most complex music ever written in this town. Um, it, it just doesn't exist anymore, and. I remember going over there and listening to this orchestra and, and finding out that, that he had reconstructed this stuff. And I was like, Jesus Christ, this guy can write. And, and um, you know, as he says, it's, it's you know, a composer is, I mean, you know, it's, it's like a, a, a writer is, if, if it's a good writer, it's a good writer. Like we had a writer from Friday Night Lights on the Orville and she was one of the strongest members of our staff, had never written any sci-fi in her life, but just knocked it out of the park um, every week. And, you know, with composers, it's the same way. It's, it's if somebody can write, you know, it's like Henry Mancini being the best example. If he can write, he can probably adapt to just about any genre. And so it was, it was a, a, a small leap of faith. <laughs> What, so what, how were you, uh, how did you kind of apply a compositional approach? You, you've also done like con concert uh, works too. So and you, you just said too that you did, I don't know if you did that on this episode, but you worked without a click track on one of your recent I do, yeah, the, the a couple did of you? recent episodes I worked without a click track. Um, actually this episode I, I had click. Um, but I, I, I mean, I, I, it's an approach I like to use because um, it kind of works on everything except action music, you know, c c music where you've really got to hit things in exactly the right place. The click is is your friend, um, and and really it takes an awful lot of skill to um, to synchronize very fast, very action heavy music without a click. So, so I am using it on some of the action cues. Um, some of the more spacious cues, especially the, the, the emotional underscoring, it's great not to have it because it allows us to to. Uh, it allows the music to breathe. Um, you know, it, it's it, you know, I I, always, I like to take the attitude in a scoring session that we're you know we're playing a concert and the engineer's capturing that concert and you know we're really doing a performance. Um, anyway, that wasn't <laughs> not relevant to this cue, but um, this cue was very much about interior and exterior, and Seth was quite specific in in what he asked for in this cue that we we want an immediate difference when we're outside and when we're inside. So I tried to reflect that in the orchestration. I tried to use a different set of instruments when you see the exterior of the ship getting squashed, and then you're inside and you're seeing people falling down and getting injured. Um, so I I, tr I kind of tried to have like a chalk and cheese night and day sort of approach here so it's it's very obvious when we're going in and when we're going out i love the that brass there that's like it's like is this like postmodernism? What, what 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 would you call that don't tell anyone but it's john adams john adams <laughs> there you go there you but, go yeah I, i'm actually something i think we've touched on is the caliber of musicians you get to work with recording these scores you know what what you hear there is it's not the first take, but that's pretty much what it sounded like on the first take. You know, they're amazing. We, you, you, you know, you, you, you start... You, you know, it, it, you know, you say you know, six M four. They turn to six M four, and the red light goes on, and and that's what you get. You know, and, and you know, beyond that, it's just a case of um, you know tweaking the odd thing, and, and there might be some notes from the control room, but you know, it, our, our job is easy in, in the scoring sessions. Um, that one, yeah, it, it's definitely. Um, like the the point John made earlier of um, keeping the motor going, you know, we want to keep the tension up, but that's a problem for us because the volume of the music has to go down when we go inside and people start talking. And I, I like to do that. I don't want to be relying on the uh, engineers to do that for me. I want to write music as if we're in the theater and the music naturally gets out of the way. So that's, you know, so I try and achieve, you know, so the, the music getting out of the way for the dialogue is something I try and achieve in the orchestration. So I'm, I'm staying away from brass, staying away from high notes, 
you know, keeping it to woodwind. And if I want anything to be really kind of biting, then I'll use piano and I'll use bassoons and stuff. I won't use trombones because we want the music to dip out naturally. We don't want, you know, there's nothing worse than getting the brass blaring away and then you can hear that someone has obviously dipped the volume at that point and it, it doesn't sound natural, you know. So that's, that's something we try and do. Um, and there was, so, there was a good example of some kind of emotionally neutral music as well there. So it was obviously ramping up the tension. It was getting, you know, it was getting exciting. We don't know whether they're going to survive or not. And then at the point where the Orville's come out of 2D space and we're back on the bridge and they say, hail the shuttle, are they okay? And we haven't seen them yet. We don't know whether Ed and John have perished at that point or not. Um, and that's that's a, the hardest tone. It's easy to write sad. It's easy to write exciting. It's easy to write joyous. It's really hard to write neutral. What's going to happen next? No one knows. Um, so that, you know, and we kind of we kind of achieve that through the harmony. You know, nothing's too tonal. Nothing's too exciting. But nothing's too horrible and dissonant either. So that's one of those examples where there's a specific tone we want to achieve in the music and. You know, like Bruce said, I probably wrote, you know, I probably wrote two or three things before I wrote, before I got it right, you know. Uh, I think we've got about 10 minutes uh, for questions from the audience. Does anyone have questions for these uh, gentlemen? Uh, and I don't think we have a microphone, so don't be afraid to be loud and obnoxious. Bellow your question. Uh, you, standing up there. Yeah, I just wanted to say, Seth, um, thank you so much for being a champion of film composition. I think that's really, really cool. Um, I like I, I love it. I mean I, I, I do it because I love it. It's 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 interesting like when you really look at the musical culture of this country, I, I mean all the really <laughs> all the really great music is coming out of film composers. I mean it's not coming from pop music. It's I mean there's there's some fun it's not. I mean there's, there's some fun stuff out there, but it's when when you are looking for for new music that challenges you and asks something of you um, beyond just you know moving your fucking ass, it's 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 it can be found in 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 the work of these film composers. So I'm you know I'm I'm just thrilled that there's you know there's people like that still around. I thought what you said about uh, Luke looking out into the two suns is a very teachable moment for young directors. Yeah. Um, there's a yep. reason why the new trailer resonates with people because of the Luke and Leia theme. And um, one thing I wanted to ask the composers is. How much are you guys talking to one another, or are you just referencing back to the previous scores to get the themes right and everything to match together? We don't talk to each other very much. Uh, <laughs> I think we're all, you know, we're always so busy uh, getting the next one ready, and it's it, the, the show is can be can be rather luxurious because um, we have these you know, great people up here that can compose great music and therefore um, we get a little extra time sometimes from Seth and that makes a big difference. Because if we're just trying to crank it out by the pound, you it, it's not as easy to get these nuances that we were able to explore with Seth. So I think it's sometimes it's just the nature of the beast that I, we did a two-parter this year, and I was doing the first part, and Joel was doing the second, and he was so busy doing the next part, and uh, so we kind of hit each other after the fact, I think, when we, we've seen the great work on TV, right? I, I found it interesting with that show, though, because we were both approaching uh, the, the story concept of the fact that now the Kalon are evil, and I, I thought we were pretty similar. It, we, we, we really didn't work anything out, but it, it came out to where it was, it was quite similar, I thought. Yeah. Uh, next question, uh, you right there. Good evening. Uh, when you were um, getting the uh, composer team together, I'm curious, was uh, Ron Jones ever considered uh, to be hired for the Orville, given that he had four years' experience on Star Trek The Next Generation, of course he worked with you on Family Guy. I was just wondering if there was any uh, interest from any party of bringing him on board. You know, it, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've worked with a lot of great composers, and, and you know, I, I can't think of one that hasn't done great work for me. I, it, it's, casting a composer is like, there's a lot of reasons that 
that you you know you have for who you choose. It's like casting an actor or, or you know picking a episodic director or picking you know your costume designer. I mean it's 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 a piece of casting and and you know it, it was a it was a specific sort of thing I was I was going for and again like it got him. I worked with Ron for years. He's fantastic. I mean he's brilliant. Um, for this show there was a there was a you know it, it was a it was a specific piece of casting I was looking for. So again that's it's you know, it's it's an embarrassment of riches to choose from, and and uh, you know these are the folks that I chose. Uh, you right there. Hi there. Thanks. I just wanted to ask you when the Orville feature film is coming out. <laughs> <laughs> we just saw it. <laughs> yeah. Let's uh, let's slow down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let us get through season three, and then, you know, we'll get on that. Uh, yes, you, uh, in the hand. How many, how many hours, how many sessions are you doing per episode to score, the, and how many takes are you typically getting in? <laughs> um, the season finale, I'm embarrassed to say I had three three-hour sessions to record with a 94 piece orchestra. So a total of nine hours with 94 pieces. A an embarrassment of riches, indeed. <laughs> How many minutes of music is that all? Oh, it was about 36, I believe. I don't know, Stan can back me up here, but, um, but it was 36 enormously complex. You know, some of the most complex music I've ever written. And hard, and man, the, you know, we weren't taking nine hours to do it because we were wasting time or they were blowing takes. We were using our time very efficiently and the orchestra was playing their butts off. Um, so it was something very special. It was, it was a real mountain to climb, but and glad we did it. That's something, that's something that can vary a lot on this show. You know, the episode is the same length every week, but the number of minutes of music can, like Joel said, you know, 34 was it, but um, some of them only have 10, you know. So actually the session time required, that's the main consideration, how, much, how many minutes of music are we going to be recording. And also some weeks, if it's an episode that's very character focused, um, the music is by nature more sustained and, you know, descriptive, as opposed to a great big battle episode where you might be scoring the same number of minutes of music, but it takes an awful lot longer to record because there's more detail, there's more to tell the orchestra. So, you know, it, it varies for those reasons as well. Uh, next, uh, you right there. Yeah. Um, first of all, I, at the university I go to, I study film comp, you have a phenomenal reputation for how this business is looking forward to film music, so thank you for that as a student of it. Are you optimistic about the future of film music and how it'll look in decades to come? Doug me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, that's a hard question to answer because it, it really, res it really, at the end of the day, lies in the hands of the directors. And there are directors, you know, there are directors like Spielberg who really understand and appreciate music. Um, and there are d directors who don't. And, uh, and it's always kind of depressing to me when I see a, a, a really fantastic piece of film or, or television, and the showrunner clearly had no fucking clue about music. And it's it's you know the, the, it's like what looks like a ten million dollar an episode budget, and it's some guy on a Casio, <laughs> and 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 it's 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 really a, a shame. So I I I honestly don't know. I mean again, it's it's. You know, these folks up here are, are living proof that, that the talent is still there. It hasn't gone anywhere. And I think there's a lot more of it than we're seeing. I just think the problem is that you, you, you have, you have a, a directorial talent pool that doesn't always understand, um, or even worse, they're fearful of it. Um, you know, I know that I've, I've encountered some executive producers of television shows that are just scared of music. They're scared it'll get in the way. and you know what they what they don't grasp is that it's it, you know if you do it right it's only going to make your show or your film stronger it's only going to it's 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 going to make it even better than it is and i think sometimes when you're looking at that that final cut with nothing in it it's it, it feels like it's done 
and then the music comes in, suddenly, it, it, to, I think to a lot of directors, it's this invasive thing that, my God, no, 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 this is totally different than what I've been looking at for weeks and weeks. And there's kind of a, f a fear, uh, you know, it's a fear of change, I guess. Um, so I, I, again, the talent is, is out there. Um, I, I just think it has to be more um, dutifully utilized. Uh, yes. Uh, we have time uh, for one more question. Uh, please make this the most profound question of all. Uh, have you already asked a question? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. And it's not going to be profound at all, but I was just curious when, when you're talking about the scoring sessions and the number of musicians uh, and stuff, like you said, you could really have like, just a keyboard player being your composer. Was it a battle at all with the studio? Because obviously you have a considerable music budget as part of the show. Was it, was it difficult for you to sell that to the studio? Um, it, it got easier the more they realized that it was kind of my thing. <laughs> But it was something that was really important to me. I, I think they just kind of gave up. Um, uh, but I mean, I, I think it's safe to say that you know, when you when you compare the visual effects budget or the production design budget or the costume budget on any show, it's not like it's breaking the bank to use an orchestra. People just don't. They just don't think it's necessary a lot of the times because they don't understand what that's. You know, probably because they've. they've haven't been exposed to it enough, but they don't understand that the, the, even if an audience does not know consciously that what they're hearing is live orchestral music, on a subconscious level, un, un, without a doubt to me, it makes that show or that film more important in, in, in how it feels as a viewer. It makes it matter more. Um, even on Family Guy, when we do those musical numbers, we couldn't sustain a three-minute musical number if it was synths. You have to have an orchestra. Whether the audience knows it or not, they're going to sit still uh, a hell of a lot more easily when they're hearing live instruments. And, and um, so it, it's, again, it's, it's not as much of a battle as you'd think. Every hour-long drama on television could be doing it if they wanted to. If they, if they, it's not that big a thing, um, but it's just again, it's, it's somewhere along the line, the appreciation of that and and the the awareness of what it can do for your project. Um, I mean, like, you know, we're two thirds of the way done before the music goes in. You know, I mean, when I look at the I look at the finished product, I'm like, okay, we're getting there. But until the score goes in, this is still a work in progress. And and you know, it and it it's transformative. And and if you embrace it, it's it's a it's the most joyful part of the process for me is sitting in that. First of all, it's the only time I don't have to fucking work. But it's <laughs> you know, it's the most joyful part of the process to sit there in that on that scoring stage and listen to what these guys have done. Um, because it's you know suddenly this thing becomes a thousand times more special, uh, and again it's something we could be we in, in in television in particular could be doing a lot more of if people um, if people understood how transformative it can be for for the work that they're doing. Uh, please uh, join me in thanking Seth MacFarlane. Thanks, Seth MacFarlane. Uh, Bruce Broughton. Joel McNeely, John Debney, and Andrew Cotti. Uh, and I want to thank Dan Goldwasser and David Fine, our fine projectionist, for dealing with me. Yeah.